I'd like to leave this quote, David Bohm's quote, on dialogue, because most of us are asking how we can make effective, meaningful contribution in this challenging time. Having a dialogue is a good place to start. Without further ado, please let me introduce Ken Sakamoto, who is also emceeing today's uh, discussion. Thank you, Ken. Today I'm going to talk about the impact of artificial intelligence, or AI, in the art world. A human brain can perform around 10,000 trillion calculations per second. This number is roughly equivalent to the mass of Lake Michigan in fluid ounces. Now, I want you to consider this. In 1940, computers had the capacity to make one calculation per second. From this initial state, they obviously had a long way to go to 10,000 trillion calculations. But computing power of these computers double every 18 months. At this rate, our human's brain have remained unequivocally superior for many decades, until they're not. This happens in 2025, the moment when computing power of computers becomes superior to human brains. Machines and computers have already taken over many mundane tasks in various forms of industry. But with calculating power superior to human brains, these AIs will take on increasingly sophisticated tasks in the workforce. Without any doubt, this great AI revolution is going to disrupt not only the labor market, but human livelihood and our existence itself. With this being said, where does art fit into this conversation? Traditionally, machines have been incapable of solving creative tasks. Does creativity require something innate in living beings? Or is it simply a matter of computational power? Is the inherent need for creativity in art too much to handle for the unconscious, unemotional artificial intelligence? To begin our conversation of ours on art, I would like to open with a discussion on a recently discovered Rembrandt piece. It's quite a beautiful art piece, I would say. I would, I would even say that this work encapsulates the capacity and creativity of human, the potential of human creativity. This is the next Rembrandt. It wasn't drawn by Rembrandt himself, but instead, it was drawn and generated and created by artificial intelligence. Perhaps some of you were already aware of the existence of this work. But if you didn't, did your view towards this work of art change at all? If so, why would that be? I'm sure there are mixed views held towards this kind of work. Some people have said that it is beautiful. Some people have said that it is soulless. In many ways, the position in which artificial intelligence finds itself in the discussion of art is reminiscent of cameras in the late 19th century. Photography, widely recognized as a medium for art today, was only accepted in practical uses then. People scoffed at the idea of photography as art. Obviously, things have changed for photography since then, so can we say that attitudes towards AI will change as well? Perhaps, but there's one difference between photography and AI. Mm -hmm. Cameras were only tools that humans used for their own creative pursuits, whereas AI has the potential to create art on its own. But you may say, wait, even if AI have the capacity to create their own art, isn't a collaboration between human and AI creativity result in better, more sophisticated work, works of art? Again, perhaps, but is it always going to be so? Let's take an example of AlphaGo. I'm sure that you're all aware of AlphaGo, the AI Go player that prevailed over the best human Go players back in 2015. Since then, the collaboration between AI and human player teams proved to be better than individual AI or human opponents. This is no longer the case. 
With the introduction of AlphaGo Zero, AI became the best on its own, not needing human support any longer. The lead developer for Zero said, by not using human data, by not using human expertise in any fashion, we've actually removed the constraints of human knowledge. That is a fascinating, yet impressively depressing statement. And who is to say that we won't find ourselves in the same circumstance in the art realm? Now, I would like to transition to the more practical side of the discussion. My presentation so far may have given you the impression that I have a rather pessimistic view of AI and art. This may be true to some extent, but I also realize the incredible potential that this development could provide us. What I fear, as I mentioned in, in the photography section, was the fact that AI may have the capacity to become more than just a tool and become an artist on its own. But can AI truly express creativity on its own? This is a fascinating question, of which I don't know the answer to. I can, however, point to you to some, some of the work being done in the field today that are trying to provide the answer to this. In order to do this, we must first distinguish supervised and semi-supervised algorithms. In supervised machine learning, all data is labeled and the algorithms learn to predict the output from the input data. In semi-supervised learning, some data is labeled, but most of it is unlabeled. And the AI must figure out the information by itself through training. Here's an example of an artwork created through supervised algorithms. It's called the treachery of sanctuary. The outcome is predetermined by the programmer, and the AI simply projects the output based on the movements of, in this case, human subjects. Now, this is where it gets interesting. A prominent example of semi-supervised algorithms can be found in generative adversarial networks. Generative adversarial networks, or GANs in short, are a particular type of generative model. A generative model is a machine learning model that can train on some set of data. What is specific to GANs is that we have a two-player game. As the players in this game compete, one of them becomes able to generate realistic data. The first player is called the generator. It produces output data, such as images, for example, and at the start of the learning process, it produces completely random images. The other player is called the discriminator. It takes images as input and guesses whether they're real or fake. You train it on real data, so photos that come from your training set, and you train it to say that those are real. And you also train it on images that come from a generator, and you train it to say that those are fake. As the two players compete in this game, the discriminator tries to become better at recognizing uh, images, whether images are real or fake, and the uh, generator becomes better at fooling the, fooling the discriminator into thinking that its outputs are real. You can analyze this through the language of game theory and find that so at some point in the training process, there is a Nash equilibrium where the generator has captured the correct probability distribution and the discriminator is unable to do anything more than random guessing because all the samples that are coming from both the data and the generator look equally likely to come from either source. So, what comes out of this? For example, let's say that you have a collection of cat photos as your source. 
and you want to generate more photos of cats, GANs can do this. They do this completely from scratch, so it's analogous to human imagination. When GANs creates an image of a cat, it's using its neural network to produce a cat that has never existed before. The cats you see in this slide are also non-existent cats. This technology has allowed for artists to create new imaginative artwork in various different applications. Helena Seren, for example, is a pro programmer artist who creates GAN-generated images from still life models, such as landscapes, food, and flowers. Mario Klingman's Perpetual portrait, Portraits highlights not the end product, but the process in which Gans goes through in producing portraits. When these portraits are formulated, it is the first and last time they come into existence. It would be the last time observers will see that particular face. So far, it could be argued that Gans does not produce entirely creative artwork, but instead only emulates what already exists. A recently published study on creative adversarial networks, or CANs, can solve this problem. CANs goes through the same GANs process, except the discriminator doesn't only try to identify whether the images are art or not art, but also tries to classify these images into established styles. These CANs artworks have been proven to be very difficult to identify as AI generated. And the process involves very little human intervention. What kind of implications arise when so little human hands are involved? One problem is the question of ownership. In 2018, a piece called The Portrait of Edmund Bellamy was auctioned off for over $400,000 as the first GANs AI generated work. It was a 19-year-old programmer who publicly shared the algorithm online that resulted in this piece. So, in this case, whose work is the portrait of Edmund Bellamy? Is it obvious? Or is it the programmer who created the GANs algorithm? Or does the credit go to Ian Goodfellow, the person who came up with GANs to begin with? Or finally, does the credit go to the GANs algorithm itself? Because after all, it, it is the AI who created the art. I encourage you to search whichfacesreal.com and see whether you can correctly identify the real human being. Why do we create art in the first place? And admittedly, I don't know the answer to this question. So I want to leave you with this question and thank you for listening. Not, I'm not an artist, nor yeah. a computer scientist, nor a philosopher, but <laughs> I think I think that come to my mind, like, uh, if you ask, there seem to be more basic and easier questions, perhaps, than the ones you asked. Mm -hmm. For instance, um, we can raise the question of whether machines or computers can, or AI can generate art. Then to answer that question, you have to say, what is art? Yes. yes. And then I can see, just sitting here listening to you, I can see two possible ways of defining it. Mm -hmm. You can define an art object from the perspective of the creator. Mm -hmm. There has to be a human intelligence, a human uh, uh, life experiences or emotions yes. that have gone into it. That's one definition. Mm -hmm. By that definition, of course, the, uh, the new Rembrandt will not be art, right? Exactly. <clears throat> you can also say, you can, you can take it from the perspective of the viewer. If I see a particularly beautiful piece of rock and I just uh, pick it up from outside and now put it on the table, now that's a piece of art. Mm -hmm. and that's entirely from the viewer's per perspective, yes. right? Yeah. If you take this perspective, then anything can be art, right? Yeah. Then, then the, the, the question gets more interesting. Yes. Then you ask whether the AI has intelligence and emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess philosophical. Yeah. I think before calling anything, is it or is it not art? I would ask myself, before I call it art, what is it that I am doing before any technology or AI or whatever? If you're a painter or why is it 
that I do what I do. Before it's called art, as it's been called a lot, the action of doing what you do, describe this to me before you call it or anyone else calls it art.